line of columns. Now, columns is, as you know, one of the most critical part of the buildings. And mainly the reason is that if one column fails, the whole building, but part of the building can collapse. Whereas beam failure is normally local. So if the beam fails, the problem is local. But if the column fails, it means the building has collapsed. So I want to spend some time on the design of columns. And we will look at various aspects of memory strength and so on. So let's, let's go there. First of all, this is beam, right? That is column. And what is this? I asked you last time also. Right. And that. And that. So which means that basically there's a transition between this one and that one. So what I'm going to present today or this is it will deal with almost everything from here to here, but mostly focused on this side of the beams. This side we have already talked about. So I want to focus on special problems related to vertical members which are subjected to high compressive loads together with bending. All right? So that's the side that we are going to talk about. So general 3D beam section, we talked about that and out of that I'm going to talk about now design as columns where the axial load is more than 10% of the axial capacity. That is the definition the ACI code uses. So if the capacity of the column is 100, axial capacity is 1000 tons. If the load is more than 10%, then we design it as a column, otherwise as a beam. And then also it should have some moment X and Y and shear and torsion can be ignored, but not for earthquake design. For normal design, it is possible for gravity design, it is possible to ignore shear and torsion, but cannot be ignored for earthquake design, which we will discuss separately. So, we are talking about a case like this. Column, which is, if taken out from the building, it looks like that. It has an axial load, it has two bending moments primarily and shear force of course. But in a building, it is connected to all the beams above and beam below. And this makes a very complicated issue and I will tell you in a minute why. Because even though we think of the column like this, reality the column is like this. So this and this are not the same. And cross section of the column of one column, what we have studied so far, we have studied one cross section of the column. We have not looked at the member <coughs> itself. And we have not looked at how it connects to other members. And that part makes it complicated, further complicated. In fact, if you look at the column design problem, we will see that it has, we have to do some iteration, a lot of iteration into the design. We cannot find the solution directly which you can do for beam. When the load is given, you can find the reinforcement from that. But column cannot. And I will explain to you why not. Look at this diagram first to explain to you why the column is complicated. In fact, the column has three complexities which many engineers do not, they may know but they do not realize it clearly. What are those complexities in a column? So this is a three-dimensional complexity space. I'm going to show you three diagrams of this kind. First of all, first complexity is the load, shape, slenderness complexity. Complexity number one is load, shape, and slenderness complexity. That means, first of all, on this axis, you have cross-section shape. So cross-section shape can be very simple. It could be circular, like square, or rectangle very simple shape for which calculation is easy or it could be an eye shape or it can be shape and can become complex. So this axis is shape complexity, right? The second axis is length of the column. Short column, long column, very long column, length of the column makes it complicated. Third complexity is loading. Only axial load axial load plus moment, axial load plus double moment, and axial load plus shear, axial load plus torsion, and so on. So vertical axis is complexity of loading. This axis is length. This axis is section. 
So if you take any column, if it belongs here, that means short column only for P and shape is like this, you can do hand calculations. It is easy, there is nothing there. P only exit force, square section, you can calculate everything by hand. It is a very simple problem. Imagine now a very long column subjected to all the loadings and having very complicated shape lying somewhere here. Now it's very complicated. You cannot do hand calculation. There are too many complications involved in that process. And we want to study them all. What is the effect of slenderness? What is the effect of cross? This one we have studied. Cross section complexity we have solved. We have an equation now, a general equation, and a program, section builder, that can analyze any cross section shape. So you are not worried about this one. You are also not worried about this one because that program can solve PM and PM both by itself bending is solved for any cross section. So this plane is covered, right, currently by using your knowledge. But you do not have any knowledge about this axis, which is the length. So this is one complexity space. Second complexity space comes from <coughs> Length, bracing, and loading interaction between other things. Because column length is one length, but also how the ends are connected is very important. Whether the top and end framing is pin, fixed, beams, columns, what is happening at the top and bottom? And that is shown by this bracing complexity. Pin or fixed, general place, general unbraced and it creates a lot of complication. Loading, same P, PMX, MU and so on, many loadings on this direction and also short, long, very long. So that means we have another complexity coming from the type of brace framing and bracing for the column. Whether the column is free to move, top ends and bottom or not, it will create complication in terms of its design. And it is related to length, and it is also related to how many types of loadings are there on the bottom. Right? We will need to solve this problem also. Third, complexity space is between section, material, and loading. Right? Material can be simple, Complex or very complex. That means it could be composite, it could be partly confined, partly unconfined, it could be uh, steel, it could be concrete, it could be many different materials. And also section shape with that and loading with that. So basically we have a, we have these things to consider for a column. Number one, section shape. Number two, section material. Number three, loading. Number four, length. Number five, framing or bracing. So five different issues complicate the column design pro column design problem and there are interactions between them that need to be considered before we can solve the column design. So before, you know, normally you may not realize that column design is actually highly complicated because of these five considerations that we have to so we will try to now consider them one by one. First of all, column slenderness. Let's tackle that, the length issue. Length and bracing issue will be tackled together. Because the other issues you already have done, you have done the cross-section geometry and material, you already have an equation that can handle every cross-section, every material. Correct? So now let's concentrate on this issue of slenderness. Slenderness is a combination of loading, length, and framing together. So it's a comp it's, it has all the three factors combined together, not only any one. So slenderness is not only length, it is also related to loading, it is also related to framing. Coming back to this Again, 
So now, which means that we have to see what will be the effect of the slenderness on this column design when any of these things change. If the length changes, or framing changes, or the loading changes, what will be the effect on the slenderness effects? For example, even if the column is very, very long, and there is no axial load, there is no slenderness issue. Or if there is intention, there is no slenderness issue. It will, it, slenderness issue only becomes important when you have high compression load. So that means it is a loading dependent problem. And if the column is very short, even if the load is very high, it doesn't matter. So it's also a length related issue. But it is also related to how the column is connected at the end. And that is coming from bracing or framing issue. So we saw that. Let's go back there now. So if you look at the overall column design program, <coughs> this is the flow chart, flow chart. Overall, you start with given axial load, moment, concrete strength, length, and so on. From that, you compute the, the, the moment, the resultant moment, estimate the cross section based on thumb rules, right? Estimate with some cross section size, check the slenderness. If, the, if this is not slender, you go to the cross section capacity and then you finish that. And if it is slender, compute design movements. Now, what does it mean? We already computed moments. What does it mean, design moments? So that means the problem now is here. Design moment and section capacity. Section capacity you can calculate by section filter. So this problem is already solved. Let's look at this problem. How to calculate design moment, which is not the same as the original moment that you calculated from analysis. And that design moment is different from the original moment because of the slenderness. Capacity surface, you remember that, right? You know these equations, we can generate the capacity, safe and unsafe. So this gives you the section capacity for a cross section. Assuming that this cross section is very short, that means length is not related to this, this capacity. But in, in reality, it is related. Is the section capacity same as the member capacity? That means suppose a column. Same reinforcement going everywhere, and you check the section capacity, it comes out to be, let's say, for a given axial load, it can carry a moment of 100 kN. Can we say that that column can carry 100 kN? No, that is the capacity of a section. The capacity of the member may be more or less, less. it's going to be less. How much less will be calculated from slenderness? If it, the length is very short and fixed, section capacity and memory capacity may be the same. But in most cases, it will not be the same. So now we are working on the member capacity based on the section capacity. So let's look at this again. Now please watch this carefully. If you understand this slide, problem will be, half problem will be solved. This is the capacity interaction curve. You know what it means. What does it mean? What does it physically mean? Can you explain in one sentence? Capacity surface. This is the failure criteria. Please remember, this is a failure criteria. That means if the combination of P and M is inside, it is considered to be safe, outside unsafe, that means this is a line dividing safe and unsafe. So it's a failure criteria, which is based on 0 0.003 concrete strain or whatever, some failure criteria, right? So this is a failure curve, and this is for a short column cross-section level. So this is 
let's say this is a short column. Now this P and M are related to each other by X and E, correct? M is equal to T into E, right? So if there is a moment, it can be converted to eccentricity. If there is an eccentricity, it can be converted into moment. But in any case, P and M are related. So if we increase P for the same eccentricity, M will increase, right? Or for the same P, if we increase in eccentricity, moment will increase. So if I, this is the case, if I keep on same if I keep the eccentricity constant, right? I increase P, then moment will increase. So it will follow this line. The capacity will go like this. So at certain point, I cannot increase P anymore because then it will be we will reach this limit. And also I cannot P increase anymore because moment capacity will be reached. Correct? So for any combination of P and E which is inside, I'm safe. Any combination um, on site is unsafe. So that is clear. So P and E. So let's take the second case now. So if I, for a case, I can draw yellow case to represent this one. That means for P and E, for certain value, I can be here. So let's say I have reached the maximum P, then at that point, the eccentricity, I can find some eccentricity and moment and I can draw this line. So if I increase P, M will increase linearly, correct? So there is a linear relationship between load and moment in this case. So I can predict the behavior. Now take another case. This is a long column, much longer than that. Same E, same P. Because of this E and P, there will be a bending moment in the center <coughs> equal to MC. Correct? Bending moment. And what will the bending moment do? What does bending moment do? Deflection. Bending moment causes curvature, curvature causes Rotation, rotation causes deflection. You know that moment curvature relationship, right? So moment will cause deflection in this column like this. So because of this, this moment and moment P into E, you will get some moment here and you will get a deflection here, correct? And this deflection will be a function of moment at the center, right? So I'm saying that the column is quite long. Because of the moment, the moment will bend the column, right? And because of the bending, you will have a displacement here, deflection here, called D, which is a function of the moment and function, and moment is equal to P into E, correct? But now the problem is that the eccentricity at this point has increased by D. The total eccentricity at the middle is equal to original eccentricity plus the eccentricity coming from the deflection. So the total eccentricity here is actually P into E plus D. Correct? Simple. So now the moment at the center is equal to P multiplied by eccentricity plus deflection. Now we are in trouble because this deflection is a function of moment. And moment is a function of deflection. So now we are in an endless loop. Correct? So if I put this back, V equal to a function of MC, and I replace M again by this one, I can go on forever in this equation. That means now we are in a self-increasing moment game. You increase the, you apply the load, it will cause moment. Moment will cause deflection. Deflection will cause moment. Moment will cause deflection which will cause, and I can say it forever, correct? So, because of this issue, if I now increase P, the rate of increase of moment will be like this. Moment will not increase by the same amount that I increase P. 
it will increase faster than that because detection will be increasing faster now because moment due to original moment will be increasing. So by increase p, the moment will increase faster and faster and if you at one point without increasing the load, the detection will keep on increasing because of the cyclic. Right? I, I don't increase the load, I don't increase the eccentricity, but the detection keeps on increasing by itself. Because every time the detection increases, moment increases, the detection increases. So you will get this curve true and you will hit the curve here. And that is the problem difference between cross section and member. Cross section will tell you that it will fail there, but actually it will fail here. Right? Which means that we have two important observations from this diagram. Observation number one. What is the what are okay, what are the two main observations from this diagram that we can see? Number one is moment magnification. The moment has increased <coughs> automatically because of length. This is called moment magnification. That means because of the length of the member, because of the reflection of the member, the moment has been magnified that we did not want to magnify. So this is the difference between applied moment, which is coming from P and E. So this is the moment from P and E, and this is the portion magnified by e. reflection B. And that is the one that I was talking about. So the additional moment between the applied moment and the final design moment is amplified moment, moment magnification. So that is the first effect. And the corresponding effect is capacity reduction in axial load. It cannot carry the same load that it could carry because of the interaction diagram. Right? So two things will happen simultaneously. The moment will increase in the column and its axial load capacity will reduce. So overall, we will get into trouble. The column will fail quicker or earlier than it would if it was a short column. And this is a highly complicated problem, this moment quantification. Because we, we do not know very well deflection. Deflection involves many things, right? Which means that this deflection D cannot be estimated realistically for a column which means the slenderness effects cannot be estimated realistically for a column easily. Which means this is a highly complicated problem to solve. And real results almost nobody knows or can determine accurately. So what do we do? What, what do we do when we have a very complicated problem? So did you, did you realize that the column slenderness was so complicated? Right. But what do we do? What everybody does when the problem is complicated? We simplify. Make assumptions, make simplification. And that's what and that's what you all do. So this is just explaining what I just explained to you. Overall objective is to estimate the magnification of the moment. If we can estimate how much moment has increased, then we can use the magnified moment for calculation and we'll be okay. But the problem is that design moment M depends on so many things that I mentioned to you. So what is the correct approach? The correct approach is that you use a non-linear analysis that includes the effect of geometric and material non-linearity of entire structure. Why entire structure? We are talking about a column. Where did the entire structure come from? 
why I am concerned now about the entire structure. Because when the moment in the column will be magnified, where will that moment go? Into means. So that means this is not an isolated problem. If the column moment increases, it must be distributed and balanced to the beams, and beams will distribute to other beams and other columns and other places. It will spread in the whole structure. And imagine each column going non-linear and moment magnification and going everywhere. So this column, moment magnification going to this beam and going from this beam to that column and that column, one moment magnification coming to this beam and coming back to this column and so on. It's a never-ending problem because every column it becomes nonlinear, it will become slender, the moment will increase, and it will try to increase the moment of the next beam and so on and so forth. So it will be a whole structural issue. That is why the real solution is too complicated and almost nobody attempts it. It's so complicated that it is very hard to attempt it, especially for reinforced concrete. For steel, we can do it easily, more easily, because E and I both are constant for steel, they do not change. But for reinforced concrete, both E and I change. So for steel member, we can estimate the deflection accurately. For concrete, very hard. Anyway, so what is the simplified approach now? How can we simplify this problem so that we can solve it? Thanks to building code, design code, they come and help us and make it simple for us. Right? Let's see what ACI does. So approximate approach, moment 25 factors in the codes. M is equal to delta M naught. Original moment multiplied by a factor which is estimated to get the final moment. So the codes have come up with this nice, good way of saying moment 25 factor. They will help you to calculate the moment 25 factor. And then you take that factor, you multiply the original moment, and then your simpleness is solved. <coughs> but as I mentioned, this is approximate. Good enough in most cases. The root of P delta effects, <coughs> that equation, basically if you look at the moment, it is 0 to L, moment integrated over EI dx, that is the general equation, right, for any, any, any deflection. And over diagram needs to be integrated, so we need to know the moment diagram of the member, which changes as the deflection happens. By e. And this EI is not constant. So we can EI along the length is changing. Every section has different E and I, not a constant long length. So that further complicates the problem. You cannot use the same EI everywhere. So each section EI must be integrated also. So not only integrate the moment but also integrate the EI, which is normally never done in practice, but in reality that is what it should be done. So because this is too complicated, we will simplify into three parts. Part number one will deal with effective length because as I mentioned to you, physical length of the column is not the one that we want. We want the length of the column which is actually deforming or over which the deflection is happening. Because we have to integrate over the deformed length, not the physical length, because of the integration. Second is effective stiffness. What is the actual stiffness for the column during the deformation, which is changing? So initially it is different. After small deformation, EI is different. After another deformation, it's different. So every stage of deformation, EI is also changing. 
right? Not only EI is changing along the length, it is also changing with deformation. So it's a, we calculate some effective stiffness which we can use for calculation, estimated. And then load. What load we will use? Original or modified? Right? So all of these things we can subdivide into dealing with the column slenderness problem. So, just to summarize, in theory, if the column was pinned at the top and the bottom, then this deflection will be like this. But in reality, columns are never pinned. Columns deform in many different ways, which I will show you. So, this simple equation actually does not hold. This magnification, this modified moment, this plus that, does not really hold. Now, the American code says that if they are trying to help you, but they are not helping you. They are trying to help you by saying that if your condition is like that, you do not need to consider slenderness. But just to check that condition, you already need to do all the calculations. And after that, you found that you don't need to do this calculation. So it's actually not so helpful because you still need to do most of the calculation that you need to do, right? Only to find out that you don't need to do. So they say for raised frames, if the k l over r is more than that, and this one, this one, then you need to consider slenderness, otherwise not. But you still need to calculate k which is a problem. Unbraced frames, and you also need to find out whether you are braced or unbraced. And KL over R to less than 22, you need to consider it, otherwise not. So these are just limits. But in practice, it is much easier just to calculate slenderness anyway. Right? There are many factors, many, many issues. First of all, is the moment diagram. Because if, you, if I go back, this equation, we are going to integrate the moment over the length, correct? Right? So we need to know the moment diagram in a column. And that moment diagram effect or moment diagram effect is accommodated by the code by using a factor called CM, moment factor or moment contribution. The moment and stress amplification factors are derived on the basis of pin and the columns with single moment curvature, CM equal to 1, that one, main thing, right? So if it is pin ended, simple moment, like I showed you earlier, CM is 1, that is the starting point. But in reality, columns do not have that. They never have that. What do columns have? Columns have more complicated moment distribution and the CM is calculated by this equation. So CM varies between 0.4 to 1, like that. Because the moment diagram can be like that, or moment diagram can be like that, or moment diagram can be of many cases. So the calculation of the CM is done based on the two end moments position, right? So both the moments are acting like this, CM is different. If one moment is like this, one moment is like this, CM is different. In your, yeah, so M1 and M2, which one will produce more deflection, this or this? Right or left? Right. Correct. So, which means that if the both the, the both the moments are in reverse order, they will produce more moment. If they are in the same direction, clockwise both, center deflection will be zero. If they are equal and clockwise, no deflection. Right? 
but if they are like this, maximum detection. So the relative direction of the moment at the two ends will govern how much moment multiplication will happen. And that is controlled by CM factor, which looks at the two moment at the end, and then based on that, you get the correction factor, which will be used for detection. So this is number one, CM. So now I'm trying to tell you how the codes try to simplify the problem. Of course, CM is incorrect in, the, in, in, in theory, in, 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 but it is good enough. So one factor is CM that you will need to calculate. <coughs> so you can see from here many conditions of moment M1 and M2 equal and same. M2 more, M1 0, M1 and M2 equal, but opposite sign and M2, M1 like that. So there could be many variations of moment in the column. Now here's the tricky part, or a complica further complication. How many load cases or load combination a column has? How many load cases a column has in a building? Hundreds, and sometimes thousands. For earthquake, thousands. Because every time the earthquake is moving, you get a different configuration of bending moment along the deformation, right? Which means that CM factor keeps changing all the time. There is no single CM factor for the column. It is a load dependent factor. That means it must be calculated differently for each load case or each load combination, which means the slenderness should be calculated differently for each load combination, not only one time. So this becomes quite a tedious work, very, very, you know, and then both directions. This is CM in one direction, column has two for two bending moment, as you know, major work bending, minor bending. So CM in minor, CM in major for each load combination. So, thousands of times you may have to calculate that. So, CM like that, and CM can be 1 to 0 0.4, 0 0.6. So, you can see from here that this is the worst case, and this is the best case. Right? Because CM will multiply later. So, higher the CM, higher the moment magnification. Second problem is, so problem number one, moment diagram problem solved by CM factor. Second problem is EI, stiffness. And as I mentioned to you, this is changing all the time. Different loading, different time, different stiffness. So how do the code solve it? Again, by factors. They say, use 0 0.2 of that or 0 0.4 here, and you can use the original stiffness to estimate the given stiffness. So 20% of this stiffness is used for concrete, right? Full for steel, or 40% of combined stiffness is used for calculation of the deflection. So these are just simplifications in ACI. Plus a factor of beta d. What is this now? Where did this come from? What is that? You know what creep, right? So creep will also increase the deflection, correct? And it will modify the stiffness. So they put the creep factor also here in the estimation of the stiffness. So basically, the code is trying to be very comprehensive. They're trying to include everything. First, they handle the moment diagram issue by CM factor. Now they're handling the non-linear stiffness issue together with creep issue by using these simplified equations. Okay? So if you use that, your life is saved. But you can see from here, 
that if you want to use this relation, you need to calculate the ISE, which is based on the number of D bars and their spacing. Correct? Which means what? Which means that you have to have the column design before you estimate anything. But actually you are trying to do the column design. So how can you have the design before you do the design? So that is another problem in column design that they are expecting you to know the reinforcement and their location before even you calculate the bending moment for which it should be designed. So that means you have to then make the best guess, do some design and repeat everything. Or you can be very lazy and you can use this factor. <coughs> Ignore the steel and only use concrete. Right? Simplify. But this will be more conservative, this will be more accurate. So, slenderness, two problems are approximated. One by CM, second one by EI, equivalent EI equations. Next one. Which one now? Left. No, loading is already done. <coughs> length. Name. The main culprit. Length. Because length has a power of 4 in the equation, right? Or 2 or 3. So the effect of the length will be very, very important because it is multiplied by big power, right? So we need to estimate the length reliably, which brings us to the next question of equipment factor, K factor, effective length factor. Effective length factor, just like CM factor, it relates the pin ended column to the actual column by a factor. So you assume that pin ended column is 1, k, then your actual column must have a k different than 1, more or less. It could be both, more or less. That makes it even worse because you don't know more or less. right? But let's see. In some cases, always more. In some cases, always less. Right? Can vary from 0 0.5 to infinity. How can you determine a factor accurately which varies from 0 0.5 to infinity? Right? Which has no limit. So you cannot estimate it well because it's a limitless value. How can the by the way, how can the k be infinity? When will the k factor be infinity? In which case? Can you imagine a case? Yeah, the structure exam is unstable. The column is just running away. <coughs> it is completely, it is it will deform without loading. It is unstable. Right? <coughs> so, in that case, k will be infinity. But, realistically, it will range from 0 0.75 to 2. The most practical cases, it will be within that range, or 2.5, if the structure is well designed. Right? But how do you estimate? In this case, if the column is fixed at both ends, k is 0.5. Because only half of the column will actually bend. Other portion will be clamped, no deformation. So only deformation will be half of the length, so k becomes 0 0.1, 0 0.5. So moment will be only integrated on half of the length. k is equal to 1 for this case. When we have k on both ends, right? This is the ideal case, not real case. But ideal case is k is equal to 1 when the actual length and deformed length are the same. K is equal between 0 0.5 to 1 when the two ends are can rotate but cannot displace. The two ends are column is fixed but the ends can rotate. But they cannot move horizontally, but they can still rotate. So K will be between 0 0.5 to 1. This is the case 
mean, lateral displacement is not possible. Now we go to the next. Cantilever. K is equal to 3. Because the total deformed length will be like that. Curve like that, like that. So K is equal to 2. Cantilever column. Pure cantilever column. And if there is a column in which two ends are partially fixed, but they can also move, then it can be infinity up to infinity. Because now it can be unstable. We don't know how much is the, the strain. And this is the case of most building columns, where the top and the bottom beams are trying to hold the column, but the same can also deflect. Depending upon the deflection of the two floors, called drift, this k could be different. Right? Of course, it is never infinity, but theoretically it could be. So basically, what we are saying is that the beams are the ones holding the column in place. So the slenderness effect of the column will depend upon the beam stiffness on the top and the bottom. How many beams are there? What are their sizes? So, now it becomes complicated because now we have to know the stiffness of the beams also, right? And then we have to estimate their stiffness and their cracking and their everything, right? So it's you know, not looking good. We just started with simple k factor and now we end up with a, another problem of stiffness, right? Again, who comes to our help? Of course, yes. And they give you these equations to estimate k, right? They say you can estimate the k using these equations. And these equations are based on a factor g m g. And g is a factor which is a ratio between the column to beam stiffness, relative stiffness between column to beam, right? And based on that, you can estimate k. Problem again is E i, stiffness. Which means you still have to calculate the stiffness of the beams and columns. All the columns and above, the beams above, all the columns and beams below, you have to calculate and calculate the ratio. And that, that ratio will tell you what is G, and then G you will put in this formula, and you can get K. This is for unbraced frames, this is for braced frames. Now what are these? Where did this come from? This came from previous diagram. Are you on this side or this side? This is the line. These are braced, these are unbraced for cases. So, for the two cases, the equations are different. So, Bottom line is, to calculate the effective length, you need to calculate the, first of all, you have to decide whether your frame is braced or unbraced. How do you decide that? Any idea? Any bright ideas? Or not so bright ideas? How do you decide which equation you are going to use? Because this equation is going to give you very large numbers, and this is going to give you numbers less than one. So. It is like, if you are this way, you will get number always less than 1. If you are this way, you will get number always more than 1. How do you make this interesting decision? And how can one building be so critically braced or unbraced, and nothing in between? Basically, braced frames are supposed to be those in which there is no horizontal displacement and the column is fixed at the top and bottom where it cannot displace, right? But unbraced frames are in which the, how can you imagine a frame which is not braced, which is not, which is braced? Because for gravity loads, it is not moving left and right, so it is braced. For lateral loads or earthquake, same frame is moving left and right, so it's unbraced. So which means that the braced and unbraced condition also depends on the loading. Which means that the this k factor 
also depend on the loading, just like the CM factor depends on the loading. So, which means that this must be calculated for each load case, each loading separately. Now, this is where it gets more interesting. From gravity load, it's braced. Earthquake load, it's unbraced. What about combined uh, gravity and earthquake? Braced or unbraced? There is something in between, but the code does not know anything about anything in between. It only knows braced or unbraced. So people have been talking about this and all kind of funny things came up until they come up with something more reasonable recently. So that is how you calculate the factor psi, which is the moment magnification factor, and then from here to here. So you sum up all these stiffness above, sum up stiffness here, divide by the ratio, you get this one, and this one is the example. The question is, what stiffness are you going to use? Again, force come to the factor. The same for beams, you can use 0. 35 IG for columns you can use 0 0.7 IG except this column, the one that you are calculating the stiffness for. For this column, you will use the equation of stiffness that I showed you earlier, right? But for other columns above and below, you can use this equation and beams you can use this equation. These are all, if I may be allowed to say, all junk equations because they have no reality. Because each loading will produce different cracking, which we do not account for. Gravity, different cracking, different factors should be there for gravity loads. There should be a different factor for earthquake, different for wind, and magnitude of wind, right? Seismic zone, high or low. How can you have the same factor for a, a, a building in Bangkok and in Manila? Totally different, right? But the course do not make any distinction between that. They say the same factor will be used no matter where the building is, what is the level of earthquake, what is the level of wind, they don't care about that. So these factors are highly debatable. How many people are members of LinkedIn or any discussion group? Anyone? If you join those groups, the professional groups, there are many groups for structural engineers, for earthquake engineers, and you can be member of many and there is discussion ongoing. And I'm talking about discussion ongoing between very senior engineers around the world, top companies, top people. And we are all debating these days, or last few days, or before that, every few months, somebody comes and posts a question, what is the reliability of these vectors? And then the discussion starts. Every time you say these are useless factors and they should be removed from the code and this but they are not removed. And this is all we have. But for now you can just use them, but please remember these are very, very in, inappropriate way of doing things. But we have nothing, we want nothing better at this time. But these factors are not right and they will be changed or should be changed. To decide between whether it's a braced frame or not braced, like I'm going to be here or here, they have come up now with another concept called sway. Right? And they say that if the building is like this, no sway, you can consider it braced. If the building is like this and that loading causes it to deflect, it is sway and you can consider it unbraced. This case where the building is inclined, that the loading is straight, we don't know, sway or not sway, right? What do we need then? We need deflection, actual deflection. And that's what we do now. So, based on the relative deflection at the top and the bottom, we can decide whether it is sway or not. If there is no deflection between top and bottom, we can say it's braced. If there is some deflection, maybe maybe braced, maybe not braced. So then we can set some limit. If this deflection is more than this, it will be braced. If it is less than this, 
if you want to base, so at least we have some logic now, right? And that is what is now. By the way, this formula sway is the most single most important parameter in building design control. Drift. Sometimes we call it drift, sometimes we call it sway. So when you do the building design and checks, the most important control on tall building design is this factor, sway. How much is the displacement between two floors? Drift. That controls everything. Yes. So a very important factor. And that is being used here to calculate. So ACI is saying that if this factor, sway, is based on that, you can calculate sway. Less than that, you can consider it to be raised. More than that, unraised. Previously, people used to use this equation. Column versus shear wall for that equation. This is the most funny one. It says that if the magnified moment is divided by the original moment is less than 1.05, you can consider it non sway. If it is more, you can consider it sway. But may I ask those people to calculate magnified moment? I need to know it is sway or non sway because I need to know k factor. I need to know everything. So what are you talking about? So almost no one can use this funny equation because it makes no sense. We used to use this equation. We are not using it anymore. This is the most reliable, sensible equation that we have now, which can be calculated. It's logical and it has some meaning. So from the analysis, you can calculate the deflection of the building, top and bottom. You subtract. Can divide by the height, calculate the sway factor. Based on the sway factor, you can then estimate sway or non-sway. Right? So let's stop here.